Hello AP World History students, Mr. Lasseter here with you again for the third part in our three-part uh, series on China, looking at it through the lens of our key concepts. In this video, we're going to be thinking about China and focusing on them in periods five and six. Uh, and again, we're going to try to hit the high points uh, of, of China, so we won't be going into all the ins and outs. Uh, but to help you keep track of all this, uh, in the description down below, I have linked a review packet that I encourage you to print out and fill out as we go, uh, taking notes on some of the more important events uh, and, uh, and goings on in China from, uh, well, 1750 to the present in this video, Units 5 and 6. So uh, let's just start with the Qing Dynasty. And this is a little bit continued from part two of our last video, uh, with our last video. And um, if you recall, uh, around 1644, the Qing Dynasty um, ousts uh, the uh, Ming Dynasty. And that's because the Ming had trouble with the rebellion. The, the Qing Dynasty, which was led by the Manchu uh, groups of Manchuria, come in suppress the rebellion, and then simply take the opportunity to kick out the Ming and rule China themselves. Uh, they were not so tolerant, certainly less so than the Mongols, enforcing Manchu culture and hairstyles as an, as an example of that. Um, uh, and then only Manchu could serve in high positions. They uh, kept Manchu from marrying ethnic Han Chinese. However, they do keep certain things that work in China, the bureaucracy, civil service exams, etc., um, there is continued interaction with the European presence, but as we will see, that changes slightly as we get into time period five. Because beginning in 1757, the Qing dynasty uh, begins a new policy of trade, and that is to limit European influences in China. Although China loved to get uh, silver and any payment for their goods, they did not have a whole lot of interest in what Europeans were selling, and they certainly did not want uh, Europe to treat China um, as perhaps an economic uh, imperial asset. So uh, China restricts trade under the Qing Dynasty to a single location, and that is the city of Canton. Uh, and this Canton system, as it was known, lasted from 1757 until 1842 with the Opium Wars. And it simply limited trade to the single port of, uh, of the city of Canton, uh, where all Europeans uh, had, and Western countries like the United States had to trade if they wanted to do business with China. Um, China was still exporting things like silk and porcelain and tea and a whole host of other items. Uh, and, but they were importing silver and, and not much else uh, early on in this uh, Canton system. Um, and they simply want to limit that outside influence. Uh, this self-imposed isolation of the Qing dynasty uh, is one reason why Europeans are able to absolutely pass them up. There was one item, however, that was uh, sold in China by Europeans and helped to create a bigger trade balance. And it was primarily sold by the British. And that is opium. Opium, the highly addictive drug, uh, which is a byproduct of poppies, which the British grew in great numbers in South Asia. Uh, and the, the increased use of opium, which you see in this chart here, showing opium exports into China, allowed the British to make a great deal of money off of China. Now, the sale of opium uh, led to mass addiction. There, uh, staggering numbers of people were addicted to opium, and it was being it was blamed in the Qing Dynasty for a breakdown of traditional Chinese values and a breakdown of the family. Um, and so, the Chinese government seeks to limit. Uh, or eliminate the sale of opium. Uh, keep in mind, this drug was illegal back in Britain, but the British sold it uh, literally by the boatload uh, into China. And so the government seeks to stop this, and the British really do nothing to stop the import of, or the import of opium into China. And so eventually, uh, the Chinese government, finally enforcing their ban on this, 
confiscates a shipload of, of opium into China. Uh, well, the British do not take kindly to this, and it leads to what become known as the Opium Wars. Now, in thinking about the, the causes of this Opium War, really it's about the ability of the British to trade in China. Uh, they certainly were more powerful militarily, uh, and they did not really want to play by the, the rules that the Qing Dynasty set out for them, because this was the way the British were trying to balance out this unfavorable trade balance. Uh, the, the Opium Wars last for about three years, 1839 to 1942, at least the first Opium War, though there are several, uh, there are a couple afterwards. Um, but the overall effect was something called the Treaty of Nanking. Uh, on the left here, you see an image of, of the war being fought. On the right, uh, the signing of the Treaty of Nanking. And this is what we call, uh, or was referred to as, an unequal treaty. Among other things, uh, the Chinese had to open up multiple ports of trade to the British, meaning the British got exclusive access to different regions of China, and they got something called the most favored nation status. Any of, um, if it, the uh, Chinese signed any trade deals with other countries uh, that were favorable, Britain also got that deal. British uh, uh, citizens who were in China also were given extra territoriality, meaning that they did, did not have to um, abide by or, or be, be beholden to Chinese court systems and said if they broke the law, they would be tried in British court systems or perhaps not tried at all by the British. Um, the Treaty of Nanking also required China to pay for the opium that they destroyed uh, that kicked off this war. Uh, and it also, of course, allowed Britain to sell opium to China indiscriminately. Of course, this is something we refer to as an unequal treaty. It was pretty much forced upon the Chinese um, by the British and uh, because they, they routed them in this war. And part of that was because China had isolated itself. It had been passed up uh, technologically, industrially by uh, European powers. China was still sort of proto-industrial, whereas Europe uh, by the mid-1800s was in the, uh, right there in the middle of the Industrial Revolution. So as a result of these opium wars, Europeans actually end up gaining much more influence in China than they ever had before. And so there are a lot of responses or reactions to this uh, European involvement, which really signaled a weakening of the Qing dynasty uh, under the Manchu. One response was quite a was was a quite violent response, and it was the Taiping Rebellion, which you see on the left. Uh, this was a rebellion that started as kind of a religious movement. A, a man who claimed to be the reincarnated brother of Jesus uh, gets his uh, a group of people to follow him and seeks to drive out foreign influences and the government which is complicit in these foreign influences. Uh, and it ends up uh, becoming a full-scale rebellion. Uh, and the Qing dynasty has trouble putting down this rebellion, and so they must uh, go to the British and the French for help. Uh, and eventually the rebellion is defeated, but it is a massive embarrassment for the Qing dynasty. It results in millions of people dead, one of the most devastating wars in history up until that point, and uh, millions of people who uh, starve as, as a result of destruction across the countryside. Now, uh, beyond that, there are, of course, other reactions to what is going on in China. Uh, China understanding that they are uh, not able to uh, industrialize on, uh, or that they are behind with industrialization, seek ways to improve their situation. And one is through uh, a government-sponsored uh, uh, industrialization plan called the self-strengthening movement. The self-strengthening movement is largely a failure, uh, but what it does is it, uh, it it intends to have the Chinese learn how to um, uh, deal with the um, or how to how to industrialize or how to create new industrial machinery uh, from Europeans, and then they will use their own um, intellect, their own tradition 
to not only learn how to make that technology, but improve upon it and thus vault themselves up into uh, a, a world power once again. But ultimately it fails. Um, the course Europeans are have, have their hand in China already at this point. Um, other countries as well, like Japan, who... Uh, when faced with Europeans, they industrialize very quickly. Japan defeats China in the Sino-Japanese War. Um, as a result of that embarrassment for China, um, they uh, they enact what or attempt to enact another reform called the Hundred Days Reform, uh, which tried to reform industry and education and all sorts of things across the board, and it is largely a failure. Ultimately, what we have here is a Qing Dynasty in decline. Uh, the leader of this Qing dynasty was the picture you see, the person you see left there on the left, the dowager uh, Sushi, C-I-X-I. And um, she is uh, kind of in her last days of, or the empire is, is seen to be in its last days under, under her watch. Um, in that decline, another rebellion sparks, uh, but this mainly aimed at driving out the British and the French and any Western influences in China. It was known as the Boxer Rebellion, and it was tacitly uh, supported by the Dowager and her government. Um, ultimately, that rebellion is also put down, and the Qing Dynasty, by that point, is in disarray. They uh, eventually uh, end the civil, the, the civil service examination system, um, and they uh, the government begins really to fall apart in favor of what will come next, the rise of a nationalist China. Um, beyond that, we also see, um, and one thing that I, I uh, have here, is that the uh, European countries in the wake of the Qing dynasty really breaking apart, they had their eyes on the idea of carving up China for themselves. Um, but really, it's the U.S. that steps in with what is known as their open door policy. Um, this idea that no country, you know, that they will trade with everyone in China, that there should be open, fair trade for all European countries there. Um, and that really protects China from being just completely gobbled up by European powers as they had in the rest of the world. Um, so these are kind of the, the final days looking at the mid and late Qing dynasty. Um, and it's really the Opium War, which is the turning point for the, the fall of the Qing. From there on, they're uh, fighting kind of a losing battle in trying to modernize. Now, beyond that, something that fits in time period five. And before we go on to time period six, I just want to talk briefly about that. Um, and that is something that we see, uh, one of the, the key concepts, key concept 5.4, it deals with the global migration, uh, uh, or with global migration in this time period as it becomes much easier. I would advise you to take a look more closely at um, the key concept video I have on 5.4, dealing with, the, with global migrations. However, uh, there are a couple things that I want to point out, with, uh, and that is that Chinese workers um, especially in the late 1800s, as a result of uh, a difficult, difficult economies in China, the Taiping Rebellion, which leads to mass starvation. And um, we see Chinese workers leaving China uh, in great numbers, going to find work elsewhere, whether it's in the Americas, the Caribbean, um, or in uh, Southeast Asia. And there, the causes for this basically are, number one, the problems in China that the starvation and difficult situations uh, in the Taiping Rebellion play a role in that as well. Um, of course, opportunities elsewhere for uh, work. Uh, slavery comes to an end in the 19th century in the Americas, but there still is demand for workers um, on plantations. Um, uh, there is uh, There are opportunities in the United States for Chinese workers building railroads in the West, um, and even gold is discovered in Australia at a time at one time, um, but the effects of this global migration, uh, one we see indentured servitude make a comeback uh, because a lot of these Chinese workers who go overseas sign indentures, um, sign these contracts to work in this semi-coerced system of labor. Um, 
We also see the development of cultural enclaves around the world. Uh, and one good example of those are Chinatowns that develop not only in, this, in Southeast Asia, but in places like San Francisco in the United States and New York and, uh, and the like. But we also see racist reactions to this. Um, in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, the United States will actually shut off Chinese immigration in the United States with what are called the Chinese Exclusion Acts. And Australia issues the White Australia Policy, uh, limiting any immigration from countries, uh, any immigration of uh, non-whites uh, from countries such as China. Now this leads us all into time period six. And the Qing dynasty technically does uh, continue into this time period. It does not completely fall until 1911. Uh, and, uh, and then we see the rise of the Republic of China, a nationalist era. Um, that Keeping that in mind, um, the 20th century is really defined by, China is defined as a kind of post-imperial China in this time period. Uh, so the Republic of China is not a dynasty like we think of. Um, it is initially led by a guy named Sun Yat-sen, who you see pictured there on the left, on the left side of this uh, Republic of China flag. Um, he was, you know, nationalist China has a tough time. They definitely, they rule China for uh, 30 or so years um, with a break in there during the uh, Japanese occupation of China during World War II. Uh, but overall, they're, they're relatively weak. Sun Yat-sen uh, presides over a weak central government, one that had ideas of democracy, but more so in theory than in actual practice. Uh, Chiang Kai-shek, who you see on the right, eventually comes to be the leader of China, and he's seen as widely out of touch um, with, with the common person in China. Uh, his government is very much corrupt. Um, when they face difficulties, he tries to suppress free speech, um, and that uh, is one of the reasons why his government loses popularity, along with the fact that uh, during World War II, uh, the uh, the the nationalist uh, factions of China seem to have less success against the Japanese than do the communists. Now, in uh, beginning in the 1920s, when the we see the Communist Party of China develop, the nationalists are very much afraid of what this means for China. They see what happened in Russia, and so they try to suppress communism in China. And this begins a long protracted battle against uh, communists. And uh, this is best known in the, the um, fight against communism in Mao uh, that culminates in his long march, uh, Mao's long march in 1934, where he leads basically the remainder of his, his men after these fights with the nationalist government on a treacherous journey through difficult terrain thousands of miles to escape um, the the wrath of the nationalist government. Uh, he leads leads with something with like tens of thousands of people and, and ends with very uh, a very small band of of folks. And it seems like the nationalists might actually stamp out the Communist Party in China until World War II breaks out. And there's a secession in the fighting between uh, the communists and the nationalists, because they are then uh, very much concerned with what is going on with Japan. Uh, Japan invades in World War II, occupies China for a time. Um, they fight against China. The communists, again, seem to have more success. Uh, the nationalists are accused of cooperating too much with the Japanese. Um, and so the, the Communist Party during this war is going to gain a a massive amount of support from the peasantry in China. Um, of course, that group that Chiang Kai-shek, the leader of the nationalists, uh, was seen as being out of touch with. Um, and, you know, both sides are, gonna, are, are going to uh, weather world, the storm of World War II. But once the war ends, the fighting resumes. And the civil war in China lasts basically from 1945 until 1949. And at the end of that civil war, some images of which you see there on the right, we have 
uh, Mao Zedong and his Communist Party come out as victors. Chiang Kai-shek and the Nationalists are forced off the mainland to the island of Taiwan. And this Communist Party in China, which becomes known as the People's Republic of China, is still in control of China to this very day. Now, under Mao Zedong, um, uh, if you if you skip down on your uh, below the the drawing the path of the long march, um, you will find that there are some major events and reforms that you need to know uh, with Mao Zedong. Um, so initially, Mao uh, institutes reforms right away in 1949 after winning the civil war with uh, the nationalists. Uh, he nationalizes uh, Chinese industries and and don't get that confused with the nationalist party of China. Um, this means that he uh, takes government ownership of, um, of, uh, he of industries in China. He also institutes uh, a f like five-year plans based on the Soviet model, focused primarily on building up heavy machinery in China. But it is his reform known as the Great Leap Forward, which is Mao's biggest misstep. Uh, the Great Leap Forward was a plan to not only industrialize China um, through uh, more uh, bottom-up uh, methods, for example, building um, uh, backyard furnaces to increase steel production, uh, but also through collectivizing agriculture. Uh, just like in Russia uh, under Stalin, the collectivization of agriculture under Mao Zedong is a huge failure. Um, he basically takes land from large landowners, redistributes it, uh, creates these collectives. Uh, the government takes their cut, but much less food is being produced. Uh, it is an abject disaster. You can see here on, on this map that death rates go up. We, have, we see somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 million people die from famine in China. This is just seen as, as one of the greatest uh, government failures probably in world history. Uh, but those who refused to go along with it were often sent to re-education camps or simply killed. Um, but nevertheless, 20 million die from this famine, one of the worst disasters in uh, human history. Now, because of the failures of this great leap forward, as it was known, um, uh, Mao actually loses a lot of support in the Communist Party, and he's in danger of losing his position as the chairman. So he uh, and his supporters enact a new set of reforms called the Cultural Revolution. And this Cultural Revolution is equivalent to the purges of Stalin in Russia. It basically silences critics and ensures Mao's hold on power. Um, he uses his Red Guard to target educated critics of him, to target bureaucrats and political leaders who do not support him. And he uses this to consolidate power once again, and it works. Mao is going to remain in charge of China until his death. Now, beyond that, um, the only other, I would say, major event with Mao is to keep in mind that he uh, has a different vision for communism uh, than perhaps Marx initially intended or even we see in the Soviet Union with Lenin or Stalin. He recast communism as a peasant rebellion, one that is not of the, the urban proletariat, but one that is the peasants rising up and seizing control of their country. Um, and because of his different views of communism, eventually there is a break with the Soviet Union. This is, uh, you know, due to some skirmishes over border and, and, and between China and the Soviet Union. It leads to a more autonomous China as well. Um, so those are just a couple loose ends to tie up. You can throw it down in the other section of your, of your notes um, on, on Mao Zedong. But once Mao dies, um, China will take a new direction. And that new direction is really signified when Deng Xiaoping, who you see pictured here with a creepy Jimmy Carter in the background, um, when he takes over in China, I believe in like the very late 70s, early 80s. Um, and Deng Xiaoping is noteworthy because he uh, institutes a series of reforms in China that actually help the Chinese economy and help China turn around and are still having effects to this day. 
The first is the reform of agriculture. He starts allowing people to uh, have some measure of agriculture that they can sell themselves to make money on their own. And that leads to greater agricultural surpluses in China. He also uh, encourages the production of consumer products in China, um, trying to find ways for uh, more the creation of, of um, a higher standard of living in China. Um, he also uh, establishes in his biggest reform, uh, market reforms. So he allows foreign companies to set up business in what are called special economic zones. And you can see those pictured on the map. And this provides a massive boost to the Chinese economy. We see huge growth in China, really beginning with these mar market reforms, which are more free market reforms. And cap you see elements of capitalism coming into China at this rate. Um, that said, it is still very controlled by the government. Um, so there still is a little bit of that command economy mixed in with these market reforms. And uh, that is uh, probably Deng Xiaoping's biggest legacy. China is a behemoth economically in the world today, and it owes a lot to these initial reforms under Deng Xiaoping. However, there are limits to what Deng Xiaoping allowed. Um, in 1989, as communism was seeming to be failing across the world, especially in Eastern Europe, the Soviet Union soon to follow, there were pushes in China for greater freedoms, uh, freedom of, greater freedom of speech, greater freedom of thought. And uh, it culminates in 1989 with the Tiananmen Square uh, uh, protests, which are largely attended by college students in China. It's, um, the, the government responds by simply crushing that protest. Um, oftentimes it's called the Tiananmen Square Massacre, where an untold amount of people are, are arrested and perhaps killed by the government. Um, they roll, as you see it here with the, the image, um, they bring the military in to break up these protests. Uh, that image of Tank Man, as it's known, um, is one of the most famous images of, of 1989, perhaps one of the most famous images of the 20th century. Now, if we think about China today, um, you know, I, I don't know how much, I, and I doubt that you will get questions about China today on your test, but just to wrap up and think about where has it gone in the last uh, 30, 40 years, um, I guess near 40 years since uh, Deng Xiaoping came to power. <clears throat> Simply put, China has grown economically. Um, it is... Uh, one of the, it is the fastest growing economy in the world. You can see it uh, here on this chart. Um, the per capita GDP uh, is up uh, in the neighborhood of um, you know 16 times what it was in 1960. Even uh, since uh, you know the year 2000, it is almost four times as much in terms of uh, production in China. Of course, per capita. So that shows just incredible growth, uh, but that also comes with some drawbacks. Uh, for example, thinking about interaction with the environment, China uh, has some of the highest levels of emissions in the world, CO2 emissions, which of course put strains on uh, not only their environment and the health of their environment, but the environment of the world, uh, the building of um, coal powered uh, coal uh, power plants is one of the biggest concerns um, and while china has taken steps to become a leader in clean energy their energy needs are just so great that they are still uh, putting a lot of these emissions out there and also they are building these things around the world uh, of course they have the means to do it and they are um, certainly um, uh, trying to meet their own growth demands um, another thing that we see economically with China is that they have uh, they want to not just be a, a, a regional power but a world power economically. And so one thing that we see is that China is uh, making efforts to increase their reach in terms of trade around the world. And this is with a more recent program called the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, that's something you might hear. Um, and it is uh, the effort of China to... Uh, to um, 
not only build roads and, uh, you know, kind of a modern Silk Road, you might even say, but also to connect ports around the world. In fact, China controls ports not just in their own country, but in a lot of other countries as well. Oftentimes they build these ports and then if the loans cannot be repaid, they take them over themselves. Um, but we see this mass economic growth in China. Beyond that, culturally, of course, uh, it is, it's tough to really say what the culture of China today is. It varies across the country. Uh, it is becoming more and more Western uh, as China becomes interacts with the rest of the world and as they do business in China. Um, politically, you still have extremely strong communist leadership. Uh, uh, Xi Jinping, the leader of China who you see pictured here, um, is one of the strongest leaders uh, in the world today. Uh, but there are still some human rights concerns in China, certainly with uh, dissenters in China, the treatment of minorities in China, especially the Uyghur minority of China, which are majority Muslim. Um, and socially, of course, there have been some recent developments. Uh, the one-child policy of China, which had been in place for quite some time, uh, was eventually was recently changed to a two-child policy. So it'll be really interesting to see how that impacts China's growth in the future as well. All right, folks, that's it. We did it. Uh, in three videos, we have covered the entirety of China's history, uh, dealing mostly with the key concepts. Um, the, I know these videos are long, but hopefully you find them useful and you've been able to go through the videos and at least target the areas that you felt weakest in and that you needed more information. Obviously, I couldn't go into everything. I glossed over a lot of things. Uh, it is quite possible that I misspoke in, uh, in some places. Hopefully not. But if you find that out, put it in the comments. Let me know, um, and I will try to make those corrections uh, as soon as possible. Uh, of course, if there is something that I went over that you just weren't sure about, the best and most active thing to do is just look it up yourself before you get to that AP exam. Uh, in your review packet, there are some bonus materials that we did not go over in the video. For example, a history of China timeline and uh, 10 major leaders to know, some of whom we mentioned throughout these videos. Um, some you may want to look up on your own. I left you some room to take notes if you so choose. Best of luck on your AP exam. Thank you for joining me in, these, in this video. And if you need any more information, take a look at the other key concept videos on this channel. Thanks so much, and you have a wonderful day.